What's up, ladies and gentlemen? Welcome to the show. And the swamp strikes back. <laughs> Once again, the American taxpayer is left on the hook for another $1.2 trillion bill. Yes, that's right. $1.2 trillion that, let's face it, we just don't have. As I'm sure you're all too aware, the House and Senate passed a disastrous budget bill last week, right before jetting off on a two-week Easter vacation. Imagine that. But don't worry, folks. They've worked incredibly hard on your behalf, so I'm sure you feel they've earned it. <laughs> Just like I'm sure you all enjoy two weeks off for your Easter, right? So today we're going to be diving into the nitty-gritty of this bill that we're all going to be paying for and the extraordinary amount of pork that's been stuffed into this thing. We're going to discuss how Mike Johnson managed to shepherd this thing through. But most importantly, I want to play some audio from Representative Katie Porter. Last week during the Biden impeachment hearings, she didn't just speak out about the Bidens, though I think the world is pretty clear on the level of corruption in the Biden family. But she actually revealed something far more insidious about who's really pulling the strings in our Congress. It's something I definitely noticed, and I didn't hear a lot of people talking about it. So I actually pulled the audio, and we're going to go ahead and go through that. I think it's actually pretty revealing. It seems our so-called representatives no longer serve the people, but a select group of elite donors and special interests. Shocker. Katie Porter shed light on why Americans keep getting the short end of the stick in these legislative nightmares, revealing what we've suspected and discussed on this show, the existence of this, this fourth branch of government, this shadowy structure that doesn't respond to your concerns, but caters to its own self-serving interests. So there's a lot to unpack in today's episode, ladies and gentlemen. And if you're looking to support the show, you can download the podcast on all major platforms and follow us on Rumble, the last bastion for free speech. And if you got something you want to say or you need to get in touch with me, you can shoot me an email at stephentoriellowshow at gmail.com. And I promise, guys, despite the swampy mess we're in, pun intended, I'm going to leave you with a little bit of hope today. So by the end of the show, I think you'll leave here pretty hopeful. So just make sure you stay tuned. And without further ado, let's do this. You're listening to the Stephen Toriello Show, building a platform of liberty for people in search of truth with a dash of hope and a life worth living. The Stephen Toriello Show. And now, here's Stephen. All right. What's up, ladies and gentlemen? So much to get into in so little time. For those of you that support our crusade against the swamp, if you could do me a favor and just hit the download button on whichever platform you are listening to the show on, I would really appreciate it. And like I said, follow the show on Rumble, man. That that stuff really helps. Rumble's certainly a lot harder to gain followers than YouTube, but I, I don't, I, I want to promote Rumble because Rumble actually supports free speech. So if you could go over to Rumble, if you're watching on Rumble already, just hit the like button. And most of all, what helps out the most is just sharing the show. Um, on most platforms, we don't get tossed around in the algorithm. So just by you sharing it to your friends and family, it actually helps out the show a lot. The good old, the old fashioned way, word of mouth. So, wow, we got a lot to get into. Um, so I want to start the show out uh, with, I want to start the show out a little bit different. Normally we do, we do some history kind of intertwined into the show, but today I actually want to start out with some words from the wise, because I think as we're going through all the, this this budgetary monstrosity, this bill. I want you to have the constant reflection back to the framers of this country and their expectations for our government. So I actually did some research on how our framers felt about government spending. 
I mean, after all, they are the framers of this great nation. And when it comes to these big issues, if you've listened to the show for any amount of time, you know that I like to always ask the question, what would the framers do? And so I did some research online, found some literature during the early years of our government, and the founders of this country, without a doubt, knew how disastrous government spending would be. I think they predicted this type of thing would happen. I think they knew that a, a government without proper oversight from the people would become rogue. And ours is exactly that. This is why these disastrous bills get by and it seems like nobody has any input. It's like they, they create these 2,000, 3,000 page bills. They give 24 hours to vote on it. And when you're going through it, you, they're actually passing bills before they actually read them, folks. Like, this is so dangerous. It's so dumb, irresponsible. All the other words you can think of, of a non-functioning government. This government is broken. The Congress is broken. Our system is broken because, unfortunately, the American people, myself included, I am guilty as charged, kind of just sat back and propped their feet up thinking that these people were going to have our best interests, and they didn't. So for decade after decade after decade, these people have been creating this fourth branch of government, this elite club that we're not invited to, and now that Donald Trump came into the picture, they exposed who they are, he pulled the curtain back on these frauds, and now the American people are starting to see exactly what's going on, and they don't like it. But unfortunately, it's going to be it's going to take a lot to 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 tie this beast down. So like I said, I want to get into some of the literature that I found from the framers. So I I did some research online and I just want to go ahead and read this to you before we actually get into the before we get actually get into the nitty-gritty on this bill. So the framers of the United States Constitution, they were deeply aware of the issues surrounding national debt and government spending. Their experience with British taxation, war debts, and the financial challenges of the early United States shaped their views. And here are some quotes from several of the founders about federal spending. So Alexander Hamilton, who was the Secretary of Treasury and the principal author of the Federalist Papers, and which is a great book, by the way. I recommend all my listeners go out and get the Federalist Papers. If you are a fan of the Constitution, then you are going to love the Federalist Papers. You can get it on Amazon. It's like eight bucks. It has all the Federalist Papers that they were writing back and forth to one another. It's Alexander Hamilton, James Madison, and John Jay. Read it, and I'm telling you, you will be on you will know exactly how the founders of this country were thinking, and you'll realize just how far off base we are right now. Anyways, so in Federalist Number 30, Alexander Hamilton argued for the necessity of a capable taxation system, stating a, quote, national debt, if it is not excessive, will be to us a national blessing. It will be a powerful cement of our union, end quote. This reflects his belief in the potential benefits of a managed debt that could help unify and strengthen the nation, provided it was kept within reasonable limits. I don't think anyone's going to argue with me that what we're doing right now, what these, what these people in Congress, the Republicans and Democrats, what the Uniparty is doing is unreasonable. These people have went above and beyond the limit. They are like at level 13 on a scale from 1 to 10 with government spending. And so though Alexander Hamilton knew that taxation was necessary, which it is, I mean, let's be honest, we need roads, we need parks, we need, we need taxation. You have to. But the problem is that these people are spending our money like it's going out of style. That is the problem. We have a spending problem. We don't have, a, we don't have an income problem. The government has a spending problem, and it's always easier to spend other people's money, right? So I, I think Alexander Hamilton would be pretty upset with what's happening right now. All right, so moving on, the next piece of literature that I found was Thomas Jefferson. 
obviously the third president of the United States and principal author of the Declaration of Independence, uh, Jefferson had a cautious approach to national debt and government spending. So in a letter to John Taylor in 1816, Jefferson wrote, quote, We must not let our rulers load us with perpetual debt. We must make our election between economy and liberty or profusion and servitude, end quote. And this quote just illustrates Jefferson's concern that excessive debt could undermine liberty and lead the country into a form of economic servitude. My Lord, was he right. This guy nailed it. And this is why I say the, the framers of this country were extremely aware of the issues we were going to be coming into. They, they knew all this stuff was going to happen. And although the Constitution may not spell it out directly, they expected us to use it as a guide. The Declaration of Independence as a guide to not interpret the text exactly how it's written. And, you know, Democrats today... They, they seem to think that if it's not spelled out directly in the Constitution, then they can just make whatever they want up. No, that's not how it works. You, we must look at the Constitution as like a guide. And so I don't think conservatives or originalists expect to read the Constitution verbatim, but to, to really interpret it as the framers would. And that's why it's important to know the mindset of the framers. This is why it's important to know history and how these guys were thinking. And I'm telling you right now, Thomas Jefferson knew this was going to happen because he said it right there in his quote. We must not let our rulers load us with perpetual debt. Like, so he knew that this was going to happen. And that's exactly what's happening. Right now, our elections are like, they're so intense because of this game of tug of war we're playing. Depending on which side wins, the country goes in completely two different directions. You have one side that wants to fundamentally change this country, brick and mortar. They want to, you know, root and branch, tear this thing out and completely rebuild from the ashes their own utopia. And you have the other side trying to tug all this stuff back and bring us back a little bit, shrinking government, bringing down taxes, trying to get it back to a place that the framers would actually recognize. And so when you have those two different extremes, it's going to be insane, and it is insane. And so now we have elections based off emotions. We have elections based off of who's going to give away free stuff, you know, like uh, student loan debt. And all this stuff, although it makes you feel good and it'll get people to vote for you, it's not good for the country. It's not healthy for a country for the government to just give away free stuff and, you know, pay people student loans like the Democrats ideas and philosophies when it comes to the future of our nation is disastrous. If the last four years hasn't been obvious enough, these people, their ideas suck. All right. Their ideas suck. And when's the last time you heard Democrats ever say anything, ever say the words freedom or liberty in any of their speeches? When's the last time Joe Biden actually said the word liberty? Never, because it's not their concern. In fact, it's completely opposite. Their number one concern is, is how can we control these people? And if we can't control them, then we'll just bring in new constituents, open up the border, let them flood in. We need the votes anyways. That's how they think, man. And so Thomas Jefferson, very aware of the how bad excessive debt could undermine people's liberties and freedoms. And that's exactly what's happening. All right. So moving on to James Madison. He was the fourth president of the United States. He was uh, they actually consider him the father of the Constitution. So Madison, in a letter to Henry Lee in 1790, in 1790, expressed his concern about unchecked government power and spending. He said, quote, I go on the principle that a public debt is a public curse and in a Republican government, a greater curse than any other. End quote. Madison's view underscores his belief that in a republic where the government is accountable to the people, the mismanagement of public finances and accumulation of debt could be particularly detrimental. Mm hmm. So James Madison knew it. Thomas Jefferson knew it. Alexander Hamilton knew it. Why can't Mike Johnson see it? Why can't Chuck Schumer see it? Why can't Hakeem Jeffries or Joe Biden see it? It's because they're losing sight of things, folks. 
And this is what happens, man. It happens. It does. It's human nature to get wrapped up into DC and get wrapped up into the politics and get wrapped up into and completely lose sight of what's actually important. And what's important is the people. You know, the people they're supposed to serve. We don't serve them, folks. They serve us. I think people tend to forget that sometimes. We pay their, we give them their paychecks. We give them their homes. We give them their paychecks. We give them their vacations, their clothes. Every dime that they get, they get from us, except for the corrupt ones that invest in stocks, which absolutely shouldn't be happening. But I digress. We'll save that for another episode. We actually talked about that not that long ago. All right. So last one I got here, George Washington. Obviously, everybody knows he was the first president of the United States. I did a lot of dig. <laughs> I did a lot of digging for this stuff, folks. Like this took me forever to find these quotes. I mean, some of these things I found in letters, like the one from Thomas Jefferson to John Taylor in 1816. So I actually found the letter, I read the letter, and I pulled these quotes. So I, I went through a lot to get this. And this was just a small percentage of the framers of this country, very important people that were concerned about national debt. But these were the ones I thought you would know the most considering how important, how important the people were. Um, name worthy, I guess I should say. So George Washington, in his farewell address in 1796, Washington advised prudence regarding public finance, quote, as a very important source of strength and security, cherish public credit. One method of preserving it is to use it as sparingly as possible, avoiding occasions of expense by cultivating peace, but remembering also that timely disbursements to prepare for danger frequently prevent much greater disbursements to repel it. Wow. That is absolutely what's happening. He was highlighting the importance of maintaining public credit, advocating for careful and limited use of national resources. So spending too much on a military, having your military sprawled and spread out all over the world, and almost kind of like how the collapse of Rome happened. And wouldn't you know it, the framers of this country used Rome as an example for a lot of the laws that they were creating. They took rules and laws from multiple different civilizations, but Rome was one of the biggest, ancient Rome. That's why a lot of our stuff is in ancient Latin. Um, so those were the four framers that spoke about national debt. Like I said, there was a lot more, but I didn't want to spend the whole show talking about the founders and how they thought about spending, but without a doubt, they, they knew this was going to happen. They knew how bad uh, government overspenditure was. They knew how dangerous it was. And you want to talk about a national security threat. I mean, I can't think of anything more dangerous than a military and a government that's broke, right? So broke that we can't get tanks, that we can't, we can't keep up with their military. That is a threat. I'm so sick and tired of hearing about national security threat from Republicans, especially when there's an open freaking border at the, the, the whole southern part of our country is open to anybody and everybody that wants to come over here. So you want to talk about national security threat. That seems pretty threatening to me, don't you think? Just letting anybody in here. We have no idea who's coming in here. So like I said, and we're going to get into this, we're going to tear these Republicans apart that voted for this bill. There's like, a, there's like um, I think there was like 100 of them or there was 25 of them that voted for it. I, no, I think there was like 100 Republicans that voted for this. I don't know. We're going to get into it. I, I forgot what the number was. But Mike Johnson needed Democrats to get this bill passed. This is, this is what I'm talking about. The Republicans in this country are begging, begging for inflation to go down. I mean, they are not sinking. They are drowning in these prices because of inflationary spending. And what does Mike Johnson do? He allows the Democrats to control the majority house. OK, he allows Democrats to create bills and then uses the Republican majority in the House of Representatives to get it through. So it's almost as if we have a Democrat majority house. Why? What? What is the point of voting for Republicans? And I'm serious about this. What is the point of voting for Republicans and giving them the majority in the House if they're just going to roll over to Democrats? I mean, it's incredible. We have a Democrat run House with a Republican majority. 
That is what we're watching right now. These people, it's just, God, man, it's just so frustrating, man. And I know, I, I get it. I hear your guys' messages, man. It's extremely frustrating. And then I get, I understand, you know, the defeatism. I get it. I, I understand why you would feel that way. It's just like, you just want to give up sometimes. But we can't, folks. This is our duty to make sure that these people are held accountable. If we have an issue with these Republicans voting for this bill, then it's up to us to vote them out. This is what we have to do, and this is what I'm trying to do on the show. You know, these people, these rhinos, these fake Republicans, they're not going to leave Congress themselves. They're not going to be like, oh, well, I'm not conservative enough. I guess I'll just resign and give my seat to a conservative. No, we're going to have to we're going to have to pry these people out of there and 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 put somebody that's more conservative in their seat. It's it's the only way, man. It's the only way. All right, so let's get into this freaking monstrosity, this swamp bill. So I got an article here from Christina Layla from the Gateway Pundit. It says House passes $1.2 trillion bill to avert a government shutdown with more votes from Democrats than Republicans. So as the House of Representatives on Friday voted to avert a government shutdown with more votes from Democrats than Republicans. The vote, 286 to 134, with 185 Democrats and 101 Republicans voting yay. I knew it was 100, and I think it was 25 that, that didn't vote. Think about that. 101 Republicans. <laughs> the majority of Republicans voted for this bill. It's disgusting. So the bill will head to the Democrat-controlled Senate as a midnight deadline looms. The $1.2 trillion minibus bill spanned over 1,000 pages and was made public early Thursday morning while Americans were asleep. So typical. That's why the title of the show is called The Swamp Strikes Back. It's because this is so typical of our swamp. For people that just started paying attention to politics in the last, since I said 2016, um, which is, you know, a lot of people because of Donald Trump. But they've been doing this for decades, man. This fourth branch of government has been doing this with our Congress, with our government, with our spending and our budget. They've been doing this for decades. All right. This is so typical of the swamp to do this. And I, I always try and, you know, I always try and tell people like we can't expect these things to change overnight. I mean, but we we're fighting back, folks. We're making headway. I promise we're making headway. You have more conservatives now in the Republican Party than you did last year. You have in the, in the year before that and the year before that. And so we're getting there. In order for in order for the Republican Party to be a actual real opposition party and not the controlled opposition that they are right now that are just completely happy getting slapped in the face by Democrats, we're going to have to vote more conservatives. That's it. We must get rid of these rhinos. And that's why I am going to post all over my social media the list of 101 Republicans. And I'm serious about this. Every single content creator, radio host, podcaster, whatever, whoever it is, YouTuber, every single content creator or anybody with a platform needs to put the names of these 100 Republicans down and show the entire country who these people are. So that if they are representing their state, these people can get voted out. That is it. That's all we can do. And so that's what we have to do. And I'm going to do it on my platform. I know I don't have a huge following uh, compared to like someone compared to a lot of people. But, you know, a few thousand, four thousand, five thousand, that makes a big difference. And that is the purpose of the show is to inform you. So that you can engage and so that we can fight this tyranny because that's what this is. We are walking right in to tyranny. And a thousand pages. Who the hell has time to read a thousand page bill? Nobody. And they do that on purpose. A shame on Mike Johnson, man. I, I really did have high hopes for this guy. I just, I'm so sick and tired of being disappointed by fake Republicans, fake conservatives that just, they just fold like a paper bag in a windstorm. 
I'm just so sick of it, man. And I know you are too. I see your messages. So the passage of the minibus follows the House's passage of a $460 billion package earlier this month, aimed at funding key federal agencies through the end of the budget year. And here is a picture of the bill. This thing is like a foot high. I'm serious. This stack of paper is a foot thick. And that is the bill that they gave representatives 24 hours to read. (laughs) They do it on purpose so they can stuff all the crap in there. All the crap that we're getting ready to go through in a second. So Representative Chip Roy from Texas, criticized the bill for its bloated spending and lack of oversight. Quote, with less than 24 hours to review, the hashtag Swamp Omnibus, a thousand pages and $1.2 trillion, shatters spending caps to fund the World Health Organization, woke DOD policies, a weaponized FBI headquarters, and utterly fails to address progressive Democrats' mass release of criminals across our borders. No Republican should vote for it. Marjorie Taylor Greene on Friday filed a motion to vacate Mike Johnson as a Speaker of the House after a $1.2 trillion spending bill. And I really honestly don't know how I think about this. The way I think about all this stuff is to do what these people think you won't do. And so Mike Johnson and all the corrupt, corrupt figures, the donors and special interests, which you're going to see here in a second, these people knew that Mike Johnson wouldn't be removed from a seat because it's just too risky for Republicans to do something like that right now in an election year. And so they planned on this, folks. This is what these nasty, this, this, these deceitful frauds do to the American people and their taxes. And so my suggestion, and just like Marjorie Taylor Greene did, is to do what these people think you won't do because it shatters the system. I mean, it is like it is a system. It's organized by, you know, uh, pollsters. It's organized by think tanks. And they 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 calculate all this stuff. And so they calculated there was a high probability that nobody would vacate Mike Johnson from the seat. While Marjorie Taylor Greene just did what should have been done. And she vacated him from the seat. Now, we don't know what's going to happen, but I'm sure it's going to throw the whole house up into the air. It's going to create a bunch of chaos, but folks, you know, that's going to be the talking point. So just pay attention this week. All you're going to hear on the news, Fox two from Peter, uh, from people like uh, Newt Gingrich, all these swamp creatures that have been in politics for decades. They're going to say Marjorie Taylor Greene is creating chaos in the Republican Party. Well, folks, I got news for these people. This is chaos. All right. What they're doing to this country is chaos. Deficit spending is chaos. Okay, inflationary spending is chaos. Spending millions and or even billions of dollars on FBI headquarters. Okay, for them to spy on the American people because they've already got caught spying on the American people. That's chaos. That's insanity. All right. What Marjorie Taylor Greene did by vacating Mike Johnson is sensible. It's something I feel all of us would do. I certainly would do it, and I support it. Is it going to look good? Yeah, I don't I don't see the American people having a problem with conservatives trying to leverage their majority. The Republicans are the majority, which means the American people voted Republicans to run the House. So why is Mike Johnson and the Republicans giving up all their leverage to Democrats? Okay, that's chaos. And so Marjorie Taylor Greene is doing what any of us would do, vacate the seat until we can get somebody in there that actually has the kahunas to fight back and do the will of the American people, period. And you know it's not good when it's not easy to find articles on what's actually in the bill. Um, when you, when you type in what's in the budget bill and all you see is CNN, Washington Post, the New York Times, the Guardian, PBS, NPR, all the leftist Pravda media outlets, that means they made out fat on this bill. Uh, you, don't, you can hardly find any conservative piece or any Republican or any right-leaning in general, any right-leaning outlet talking about this bill because it is a freaking disaster. So here we go. 
So we're going to read it from the Washington Post because just so that we can see all the garbage that was in it, they may not put everything that they wanted in this article because it makes them look bad. Listen, Democrats, people on the left, they know what they're doing to this country. Like they know sending, you know, $50 million for LGBTQ uh, uh, activist organizations. It's not a good thing. It's not a good look and the American people don't like it. And so they're not going to report on it, honestly. But I just want to go through a couple things that are in it. So after hours of gridlock, the Senate approved a $1.2 trillion spending package to avert a partial federal shutdown. Passage came after a after 12.01 a.m. deadline, meaning some federal funding technically expired briefly. The White House said President Biden will sign the bill later Saturday. The bill funds about three quarters of the federal government for the next six months, while also raising military pay, eliminating U.S. funding for the U.N. Agency for Palestinian Refugees and bolstering security at the U.S.-Mexico border. The Office of Management and Budget has stopped preparing for a shutdown, the White House said in a statement, because there is a high degree of confidence that Congress will immediately pass the relevant appropriations and the president will sign the bill on Saturday. Because obligations of federal funds are incurred and tracked on a daily basis, agencies will not shut down and may continue their normal operations, which means garbage. Every day that these every day that this government is open, the American people lose more and more of their freedoms. We spend more and more money. This government bureaucracy is massive. It is massive. When I tell you massive, it's going to shock you. Let's just say just federal employees alone in D.C. is like 2.5 million. When you add in the federal contractors, which means they're not federal employees, but contracted by the federal government, it's upwards between 10 and 15 million. Think about that. 20 to 30 million people work for the government bureaucracy. I would say that's a little big, don't you? Doesn't, doesn't that seem like a little unnecessary? This is why we're spending too much money. Too much money goes to it, the government's just too big. It is, the government is simply just too big. That's it. That, that's, that's the main point. It's just too big. It, it, we must shrink government. Um, so let's see here. So I actually want to go in what's in the garbage bill. All right. So, of course, Republicans are all, you know, the ones that voted for it, the hundred are saying, yeah, it's going to add like, I think 12 or 12,000 more ice beds. Like that is their big talking point. The Republicans. Oh, it adds ice beds, which means more beds at the southern border to what detain people. But then it also gives more border patrol agents to shut down the border. Oh, no, absolutely not to actually process the illegal immigrants faster. This is what we've been saying from the very beginning. So the border agents that go down there, they're not going down there to secure the border. They're going down there as processors so that these people can be processed into the country faster. Make that make sense. How is that securing the border? It is not. It is expediting the flood of illegal immigrants into our country or what they would call asylum seekers. But they're not legit asylum seekers. And so therefore they are illegal immigrants. OK, and every single one of them needs to be deported. If they came in during the Biden administration under asylum, they need to be deported back to wherever they came from. And that's exactly what Donald Trump said he's going to do. Is it going to be tough? Yes. Is it going to be hard for Americans? Yes. It's not going to look good. It's not going to feel good, but it's necessary. All right. These people can't stay here. You can't just have a country flooded with 10 to 15 million illegal immigrants, essentially adding an entire state to our country. You just can't do it. It doesn't make sense. It, it, that is you are purposely destroying your own country. And what's worst is that the American people are paying for it. That is what pisses people off. They're paying for this disaster. How much are they paying? Well, we know so far in a previous episode that we did that $487 billion annually goes towards the illegal immigration crisis at the southern border, which means the money that's being spent on money being spent on medical, the money being spent on schools, the money being spent on shelter, clothes and gift cards and food and go down the list. Four hundred eighty seven billion dollars a year. OK, a year. 
So almost a half of trillion dollars the American people spend on this this self-inflicted Joe Biden created border crisis. And how much did Donald Trump want for a wall? I, I think he said what five billion. I think total it was going to cost forty billion. Hmm. Let's see here: four hundred eighty-seven billion a year, or forty billion for a wall indefinitely. Hmm. I don't know. It seems like a pretty hard decision to make. Well, they chose the four hundred eighty-seven dollar, four hundred eighty-seven billion dollars a year. Why? Because it's not their money, and it's always easier to spend other people's money. You know that. I know that. When we go shopping and we have somebody else's credit card, are we going to, and we're shopping for them, are we going to buy the best thing? Are we going to necessarily take our time and, and look for the better deal? Are we going to take our time and look for the better quality product? No, we're going to go in, we're going to max out the card on whatever we want, and then we're just going to go and try and convince them that it's actually what they want too. That's, that's, what, they, that's what we're dealing with right now. In our government, that's what our government's doing. And so it's really hard to find exactly what's in the bill. Why? Because nobody's had time to read it. But several people that uh, that look into these bills, you know, usually when they have time to before they pass so that they can inform the American people on to call their representatives and either tell them yay or nay, because that's how a functioning democracy works. OK, that's how a republic works is we we call our representatives and we tell them, no, we don't like this or yes, we like this. But passing a bill in 24 hours doesn't give a lot of time for people to actually read it to see what's in it. But what I can do is I'll go ahead and play some audio from the Republicans themselves. I have some audio here of Chip Roy where he exposes the Washington, D.C. swamp, too. Here, check this out. The gentleman from Florida a moment ago talked about the fact that we defund UNRWA and we defund some policies that are pernicious. I agree with him. It was a part of the process that we carried out last year when we set out to change this institution to return to some sort of regular order to have 72 hours to read bills, to be able to have single subject bills, to offer amendments on the floor, to actually have an appropriations process. We passed seven appropriations bills off of the floor of the House. We passed three out of committee to the floor. We actually had some amount of debate we're able to move things through. And we got some of our policy priorities and we then sent them over to the Senate. And then what do we do? We walked away and we went back to business as usual in the swamp where a handful of people that they call four corners all sit back and decide for you. Not the people in this room as a body, but a handful of so-called cardinals. The same group that I heard guffawing in the back a minute ago. The same block of appropriators that think they're the ones to get to control the entire world and use our men and women in uniform as an excuse to undermine the national security of this country by spending money we don't have, by racking up debt to the tune of a trillion dollars every 100 days, while funding all manners of sins with respect to transgender surgeries, abortion, tourism, funding the World Health Organization to give away our sovereignty, funding open borders with mass parole that led to the death of Lake and Riley. Everybody who votes for this bill today, you own it. Don't go out and campaign this year saying you oppose this stuff when you write the check, because that's what's happening today. Every single Republican, every single Democrat who votes for this omnibus spending bill today, they own it. They own the, op own the open borders. They own the woke military that we cannot recruit people to fight in. They own giving our sovereignty to World Health Organization and international bodies. They own more funding for the Wuhan lab. Yeah, that's all in there. They own it. We should vote no. You want to win in November? Vote no. I yield back. So Republicans are lauding the Homeland Security spending portion of the deal. The bill increases the number of immigration and customs enforcement detention beds at the southern border and funds 22,000 border patrol agents. GOP negotiators also secured funding cuts to non-governmental organizations. Hmm. So 22,000 border patrol agents, man. That means they're going to be processing a whole lot of illegal immigrants into this country. So let's just say I guess you could say the crisis at the southern border and the amount of illegal immigrants coming into this country is about to get a lot worse. So House Speaker Mike Johnson 
the uh, from Louisiana said in a statement after the bill's release that the deal, quote, moves the department's operations toward enforcing our border and immigration laws. How about this, Mike Johnson? If the border isn't shut down, we're shutting down the government. How about that? Why is it so hard for these people to do that? I mean, this is what the American people want. Every single person I talk to, they don't care if the government shuts down. The only people concerned about a government shutdown is the government, is the bureaucracy. And what is the big deal about a shutdown anyways? It's getting ready to shut down for Easter for two weeks, is it not? <laughs> I mean, and so what's going to happen to the government over Easter break? Nothing. And so who cares if the damn thing shuts down? Shut it down. These people are so weak and feckless, they don't even know how to use their, their leverage. How is it that me, a lonely podcaster, knows how to leverage the House of Representatives better than Mike Johnson, better than career politicians? It doesn't make sense. It's because they've been corrupted. They're not in it for us anymore. They have too many people speaking in their ear and too many, too many donors and special interests telling them what to do. And so Johnson and congressional Republicans also hailing block funding, blocking funding to UNRWA, the UNRWA, the United Nations agency delivering aid to Palestinians in Gaza until March 2025. After Israelis allegations that 12 of the agency's 13,000 workers abetted Hamas in the October 7th attack. Yeah, that seems like a pretty good thing to do, right? Other GOP victories include a new rule for the Consumer Product Safety Commission preventing it from banning gas stoves and allowing U.S. embassies to fly only the American flag or other official flags, excluding pride flags and the conservative flag. <laughs> That's what you got, folks. That's what Mike Johnson and, the, and your esteemed colleagues in the Republican Party, that in, in, in the House of Representatives, that's what they got you. <laughs> to stop the Consumer Product Safety Commission from banning gas stoves and flying uh, uh, fl uh, and forcing U.S. embassies to fly only the American flag or other official flags, excluding pride flags and the conservative flag. <laughs> Um, and so let's get into who made the better deal here. So what are Democrats toting? So Democrats are celebrating a new $1 billion investment in child care and Head Start, a federally funded childhood development program for low income families. Hmm. I'm sure your child care is not going to go up in price at all. <laughs> These people, man. Oh. The deal also includes increased funding for Alzheimer's research, cancer research, and mental health programs. These organizations, <laughs> these cancer research programs, they are living like freaking kings off your dollar. And are we any closer to cancer? Are we any closer to curing cancer? How about Alzheimer's? How many billions of billions upon billions of dollars has been put into has been put into these organizations that are researching cancer? You ever meet somebody that is the head of one of these organizations? They are multimillionaires. They live in mansions. They certainly aren't living at the labs that they're supposed to be working at. <sighs> it is all a sham, folks. NGOs, non-government organizations, and these uh, uh, federally subsidized programs, these these research programs are the biggest burden on the taxpayer than you can ever imagine. Billions of dollars goes into these research programs and the American people don't get jack squat back. Nothing. All the research and all the developments for cancer treatments, all the all the successful cancer treatments and Alzheimer's treatments all come from private companies. OK. Here we go. So Democratic negotiators also were able to secure increased funding for the Defense Department's climate and energy resilience against climate change. So climate change, more climate change stuff. The bill additionally extends PEPFAR, the president's emergency plan for AIDS relief, until March 25. The program is aimed at combating the HIV and AIDS epidemic across the globe. Oh, spending, sending money across the globe now. Yes. That sounds like a great idea. I can't think of anything that more people are pissed off about than sending our money all over the globe to other countries. I'm serious. Every single person that I've talked to that's had a problem with the spending of our government, the number one thing they say is they want America to come first. The homeless veterans in this country, the homeless people in this country, the families, put America first for once. This is what people are wanting. 
And it's so easy. All these people have to do is talk to their constituents, but they don't because they're to, because they're too detached from the real America. All right, continuing. Notably, Democrats were not only bragging about the spending victories they could get, but also that they were able to prevent Republicans from tacking on to the final deal. Quote, we defeated outlandish cuts that would have been a gut punch for American families in our economy. And we fought off scores of extreme policies that would have restricted Americans' fundamental freedoms, hurt consumers while giving giant corporations an unfair advantage, and turned back the clock on historic climate section, on, on, on historic climate action. Senator Patty Murray, the Democrat from Washington, chair of the Senate Appropriations Committee, said in a statement after the legislation's release. So all I got to say is if Democrats are coming out of this cheering, how is that possible? <laughs> How is it possible that Democrats are celebrating a bill that got passed the House when the House is Republican majority? It's just mind blowing. <laughs> it's so mind blowing, man. How is it possible? Well, I'm going to explain to you how. Uh, but before we do that, here's some more words from the wise, a quote that I actually found as I was doing research for the literature of our framers. Um so here's a quote from a very famous, uh, I wouldn't say the framers of the country, but certainly one of the forefathers. He said, America will never be destroyed from the outside. If we falter and lose our freedoms, it will be because we destroyed ourselves. You know who that great wise man was? Abraham Lincoln. So if this country does collapse, it will collapse because of government spending. That's right. So I told you I had some audio from Katie Porter. And and so I want to go ahead and get into that. So in the Biden impeachment hearing where Biden business partners came in to testify that Joe Biden didn't just know about his son's business dealings. Joe Biden himself was the business like he was the business peddling influence was the business, the Biden brand. This is. Joe Biden is a traitor to this country. I'm, I'm, I'm serious. Joe Biden is a legit traitor to this country. He sold out his country for money. He sold his power and influence for money to our adversaries. And I don't say that word lightly. I don't throw it around. You know, I, I'm not somebody that calls everybody I don't like a traitor. But if you think about it, Joe Biden sold his power and influence to foreign adversaries. And he did it through the guise of his son's business. Joe Biden's power and influence was the business. This country has never, ever in its history seen a influence peddling scheme like this one. This operation, this, this web of corruption is so big and so complex that it's going to, people are going to be writing about this for years. And whoever gets it is probably going to be uh, is probably going to get a Pulitzer Prize. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Those prizes are only for people that write stories about Russia collusion, fake stories. No, real stories our media has no interest in doing. So, but that's where I got this audio from. Was from testimony in the Biden impeachment hearing. Very, I mean, there was a lot of good stuff. A lot of nice audio clips. But folks, I actually don't even want to get into it. We'll get into it on the next segment, the Biden impeachment thing. It's not looking good for Republicans. I don't know what they're doing, but they don't hold a candle to Democrats when it comes to impeachment. They actually have evidence, receipts, documents, eyewitnesses giving testimony. And they are not going to put this impeachment up for a vote. They can't. Think about that. Republicans need to get it together on this impeachment. How do you how do you defend against receipts and eyewitnesses? Every single time a Democrat would come in, all they did was try to destroy the character of the eyewitness or they would come in and talk about Trump. It was completely emotional. It was emotions filled testimony from Democrats and Republicans are just getting the, the Democrats are wiping the floor with the Republicans when it comes to this impeachment. Think about that. Democrats managed to impeach Donald Trump not once but twice on completely fake charges. How is it that Republicans can't can't do this? 
It's because they're not used to it, man. They're cowards. They don't, they, they don't have brass knuckles. They're not fighters. They're weak, feckless nerds that find themselves in the House of Representatives. That's it. They're, they're, they're not built for this. And it's unfortunate because this is the biggest influence peddling scheme this country has ever seen. It is the Biden family is going to go down as the most corrupt family to ever step foot in the White House ever, ever. And somehow Joe Biden's not going to get impeached. Just like somehow Joe Biden willfully retained classified documents and shared classified information with unauthorized sources, and he's not going to be prosecuted. It, it is so mind-blowing, the double standard of justice. The, when it, Not just justice, but everything. No accountability for anything. And so Hunter Biden didn't even show up for his subpoenaed testimony that he was supposed to give. You guys remember that Hunter Biden was begging the Republicans, saying, why don't you do a public hearing? Why don't you do a public hearing? Right? The media was backing up Hunter Biden. Oh, why don't they just do a public hearing that they want testimony that bad? Well, here it is. They do a public hearing and he doesn't even show up. <laughs> just ignores a subpoena. And so we'll get into that on the next show. However, in this impeachment hearing of Joe Biden, Katie Porter revealed a huge amount of truth about our politics inside one of the most corrupt cities in the world, Washington, D.C. All right. Um, this is the reason why these types of bills get passed in your House of Representatives. Check this out. We should have a policy discussion about how to stop government officials from using their positions to get money or favors. Now, that is a real hearing, one that nearly every American, regardless of party, wants us to hold. We could start by talking about how senior executive branch officials can leave public service, wait just one year, and then legally become lobbyists for big corporations scoring their new employers profitable government contracts and favorable regulations. They can even be paid by the big corporations during that short one year mm -hmm. while they are waiting to become lobbyists as a down payment for their future ability to peddle influence. That's wrong. Yep. For the panel of witnesses, by show of hands, as, as um, Americans... Would our witnesses support extending this one-year waiting period to at least two years? No, I would. Okay, so there we go. Republicans, Democrats, even convicted criminals. Everybody <laughs> supports that we should do more to stop influence peddling. This is the kind of good government reform that Americans of all political stripes support. And I should know, in 2022, I passed that exact reform as an amendment to the National Defense Authorization Act with a bipartisan majority vote. What happened to that amendment? Why didn't it become law? The answer is simple. Nearly 500 former members of Congress work for lobbying firms. And too many people around here want to follow in their footsteps and so don't want to make it harder for government officials to become lobbyists. Ultimately, Democratic leadership under then-Speaker Nancy Pelosi let the amendment get stripped out of the final bill. When I offered up the amendment again during this Congress, Republican leadership under then-Speaker Kevin McCarthy never even put the amendment up for a vote. Huh. Both parties have let us down on fighting influence peddling and tackling corruption. But I'm hopeful we can begin a new approach in this very committee. Let me give you some facts. I don't even need a whiteboard for this one. 495 former members of Congress work for lobbying firms. Mm -hmm. 467 members of Congress take corporate PAC money. Wow. 78 <coughs> members of Congress violated the Stock Act last Congress. Clearly, we have our work cut out for us. So let's start the conversation no today on what a bipartisan ethics reform package could look like. Here are the organizations that could have come today as witnesses so we could have had a productive conversation. Oversight staff, do you have your notebooks ready? Citizens for Responsibility and Ethics in Washington, Common Cause, Project on Government Oversight, Public Citizen. With the right witnesses, 
and the commitment to doing what the American people want, this committee can have a real conversation about the problem of influence peddling. And we can pass legislation to create badly needed ethics guardrails. That would be real work, not a real circus. I yield back. Yep. I don't know about you folks, but that sounds pretty damn good. The problem is, is that the people that are peddling their influence are the ones that have to vote it into law. This is the problem we're up against. Our government is being ran by the lobbyists and the donors and the special interests. These representatives that you vote into office, they're not answering to you. They're answering to their corporate donors. They're answering to their special interests. These are why these monstrosity, these, these monstrous, disastrous spending bills keep getting passed without the American people's approval. Are your representatives coming to you, to your town halls, and saying, hey, what do you think we should do? Should we vote for it, yay or nay? Are they doing that? No, that's what they're supposed to do. In fact, that's exactly what House representatives are supposed to do. That's why they get so much time off. They're supposed to go back home. They're supposed to have town halls, and they're supposed to ask their constituents, what should we do? And they take their constituents' votes back to the, back with them to Washington, D.C. Is that happening? No. How is that happening, and how could that possibly happen if they're passing bills within 24 hours? 1,200-page bills. Now, were they able to read the bill, come back to you in, your, in their home state, and say, hey, here's the bill. Did you read it? And so what do you think? No. Why? Because they had 24 hours to vote on it. These bills are being created. We have a fourth branch of government, a corrupt bureaucracy intertwined with huge corporate donors and special interests, the rich elites, and they are the ones creating our spending packages, not our representatives. The corporate donors and elites and the special interests, Chuck Schumer, Mike Johnson, the swamp, the swamp is just doing what the swamp does. That's why we got stuck flipping this $1.2 trillion spending package that gives the Republicans 22,000 more Border Patrol agents to process the illegal immigrants into the country faster, some extra ice beds. Oh, and don't forget that um, the embassies around the world can no longer fly the LGBTQ flag. That was a win to Republicans. That's what they got you. All right. Meanwhile, Democrats got all kinds of funding for climate change and uh, uh, their climate change religion. They got all kinds of funding for their special interests and their donors. This is how it's working. This is what is happening. It is this. It's this cycle. The special interests and donors create these bills, right, for Washington, D.C. to pass. And in those bills is more money for the special interests and donors either their corporations, their companies, the people in Washington, D.C. are peddling their influence for money. This is exactly what Katie Porter was talking about. We must stop it. And I know it's, it's I know it. you just want to give up. You just want to surrender. I get it. I get it, man. Because we have to rely on these corrupt swamp creatures to, to vote this type of regulations in. I get it. And she said, what, what did she say? 78? House members or 78 Congress people, congressmen and women violated the Stock Act. That means insider trading, folks. This is what I'm saying. Like, who thinks, who out there thinks it's a good idea for people in Congress to buy and trade stocks? <laughs> it is the most ridiculous thing. Why do you think Nancy Pelosi is worth hundreds of millions of dollars? Not one or two million. She's worth like 80 million. She's like up in there in the hundreds. How is that possible? How is it possible that Congress is allowed to buy and trade stocks? They can't do that. That's insider trading. If me and you were caught doing that, we'd go to prison. Ask Martha Stewart. <laughs> That's what she got caught doing. But yet these politicians can do it as if they're not even doing anything wrong. They go in broke and come out millionaires. You just had Mike Gallagher, I think his name is. He just left the House of Representatives, leaving the Republicans with a one-seat majority. Think about that. Just vacated his seat, his House seat. Where did he go? 
Where's he going to get money? Are we still paying this fool? I hope not. That's what I'm going to be looking into in the next show. I mean, my lord, man. I mean, it's so broken, man. The framers of this country, and you heard their quotes at the beginning of the show, they'd be rolling in their graves if they seen what was going on in this country right now. Disgusting. Washington, D.C. is the real city of sin. There's no doubt about it. But I do want to... I told you we'd leave here with some hope, and so that's what I'm going to do. Oh, and just for your information, Katie Porter is a Democrat. So that's not the hope I was going to that's not the hope I was going to give you but I just wanted to let you know that Katie Porter is a Democrat. So it, we do have some sane rational Democrats that that see the corruption inside the system. Not all Democrats are corrupt like Chuck Schumer and Nancy Pelosi. So Katie Porter's a Democrat, she sees what's going on. But here is the hope I wanted to leave you off with. So I got an article. It's kind of old, but it's got some interesting uh, information. It's got some interesting poll numbers. It makes some comparisons between Gen X and Gen Z voters. In 2012, when Barack Obama won re-election, Gen X voters preferred Democrats in control of Congress in, in control of Congress over Republicans by seven points, 48 to 41. Yet 10 years later, when the GOP won control of the House but came up short winning the Senate, Gen X voters preferred Republican control by 12 points. Do you see that? So in 2012, they preferred Democrats by 7 points. And now 10 years later, they prefer Republican control by 12 points. Which means the younger voters, they're starting to lean conservative. This is the message I wanted to send you off with. As bad as it may seem, as as tough it as tough as it is to swallow, you know, these massive one point two trillion dollar bills, as frustrating as it is, as pissed off as you may be, just remember that the younger generation, our kids, my kids in particular, they are growing up more and more conservative. Why? Because it is the cycle, the cycle we talk about on the show all the time. Strong men create good times. Good times create weak men. Weak men create hard times. Hard times create strong men, and strong men create good times. It is a cycle that goes around. So the hope I wanted to leave you off with is I think we're in the cycle of hard times creating strong men and those strong men creating good times. I see good times on the horizon. It may not seem like that now, and I have faith that the younger generation grew up in a time that they don't want this insanity. I'm telling you, it's not in our human nature to believe that men can give birth and that men should be competing in women's sports and all the other crazy ideology like uh, chopping, like mutilating children's genitals and having drag queen story hour and pornography in schools. The younger generation sees how crazy this is. I know it's shocking, but the polls show it. The polls show that Gen Z is moving Republican. Now, does that mean Donald Trump's going to win? Not necessarily. I'm sure a majority of young voters will probably vote Democrat because there's, you know, a majority of them are stuck in this emotional servitude to DEI and, and uh, BLM and all the woke garbage, like the free college, the free stuff. But when you look into these numbers, even millennial voters moved more to the GOP. So in 2012, these voters preferred Democratic control by 16 points, but that shrank in 2022 with voters preferring Democrats by just six points. Strikingly, these voters also became more liberal over the last 10 years, but our pollsters attribute that to all Democrats becoming more liberal since 2012 due to the, due to the country's increased political polarization. So the younger crowd is craving freedom and liberty. They're craving conservative ideas. Based off the numbers, they're starting to reject all this DEI and this woke 
you know, social justice warrior garbage. Now, how long is it going to take? I don't know. It could be Donald Trump. It could be that he could get the majority of young voters. If he does, then it's a wrap. If Donald Trump gets more support in the black community, which he is, if he gets more support in the Hispanic demographics, which he is, more support in the female demographics, which he is, all his support for all the demographics is going up. If he manages to get a majority of the young vote, man, you're talking landslide victory, which won't be a landslide with all the Democrats cheating. That's going to take up a big chunk of the a big chunk of the victory, because without a doubt, there's going to be some shenanigans in this election. <laughs> without a doubt, it is going to be a wild, a wild election based off some of the stories and looking into these polls it's actually shocking that majority of americans think there's going to be violence in this upcoming election who do you think the violence is going to be from do you think it's going to be maga violence burning down cities and robbing and looting stores well who was burning down cities and robbing and looting stores and killing people back in 2020 during this during the summer of love the summer riots well, that would be Democrats. And so if the violence is going to come from anywhere, it's going to be Democrats, especially if Donald Trump wins. If Donald Trump wins, we all know that these people are going to be, their hair is going to be on fire. They're going to be mobbing and rioting in the streets. But that's not how our country works. That's not democracy. That is mobocracy. That's mob rule. It's not how any of it's supposed to work. You guys notice that all the businesses and in Seattle and in LA, all the all the blue states, all the cities that were going through the summer of love, going through all these riots from BLM, the Floyd Palooza. You notice that they had all their businesses boarded up and then Joe Biden won and nothing happened. Why do you think that is? Who do you think's more likely to commit violence during the election? Hmm? It's obvious. The Democrats. Why? Because Democrats are insane, irrational, emotional lunatics. That's why. And they can't get a grip, just like they couldn't get a grip in 2016. Anyways, I'll save that for another episode. I just wanted to leave you off with some hope that based off the poll numbers that we're starting to see, there is a really strong indication in the poll numbers that the younger voters are moving more conservative. That's it. My kids, both of my kids are conservative. I mean, yeah, they're young. One's, you know, 16 and the other one's getting ready to be 14. But without a doubt, they know what liberty is. They know what freedom is. Obviously, their dad does a podcast. Obviously, I do the podcast here. So, of course, my kids are going to know a lot about what we talk about because I discuss this stuff with my kids because I want them to know. Me and my wife both do. We make sure that our kids know about all this stuff. My kids are going to grow up to be very, very conservative. So they're going to be in this group for sure. But the good thing is, is that it, based off the numbers, it looks like the younger voters, the Gen Z, they're starting to see the light. And that is all we need. I was concerned there for a little while that it, it's like, if, if these people didn't come and see the light, I didn't know what the future of this country was going to look like. But this really does give me a lot of hope for the future of this country. If we have an entire generation of young kids that are growing up to be more conservative. It's like it's like one big cycle, man. I don't know what it I don't know what the name of the cycle is, but it is that cycle. I truly do believe that is what's happening. Joe Biden and the Democrats have created such hard times for younger voters. Like they see no future, they see no way out, and they see who's in charge. So and when you're making their lives harder, like harder to get a home, harder to to get a college degree, harder to survive and go grocery shopping, when they got to work three jobs just to get by, when gas prices are four dollars a gallon, they're gonna see who's in charge and they're gonna vote the other way. I'm telling you, from what I can gather. The biggest concern with younger candidates or with younger voters is they they say they're not being informed on the candidates. And so if by happen chance somebody from the Trump campaign or any conservative campaign that's listening to the show right now, you got to figure out a way 
to connect with the younger voters through social media. Because in the poll numbers, it's starting to show that younger voters get their news from social media. So we got to make sure Republicans and conservatives get the message out. That's why I'm on TikTok. And this is why I thought it was such a dumb idea at first for conservatives to, to be on this jihad against TikTok. It didn't make sense. I still think it's a bad idea. Donald Trump said it's a bad idea. Donald Trump's saying it's a bad idea because he knows that banning TikTok, if conservatives were to ban TikTok, that would really, really lose a lot of support from the younger voters. They love TikTok, period. All right. That's just their thing. Just like for millennials, Facebook was our thing and MySpace. <laughs> you guys remember MySpace, right? Yeah, that was our thing. So TikTok and Instagram, that's that's the younger, that's Gen Z's thing. And so to any campaigner out there, any conservative that's listening, that's running a campaign or, or any candidate that's listening to this by happen chance, I don't expect a lot of candidates to be listening to my show. But hey, if they are, Make sure you got to figure out a way to connect to the younger voters through social media, more notably TikTok. And do not do not let Republicans ban TikTok. What a freaking disaster that would be, because something I noticed about TikTok, because I um, I post a lot of my stuff on TikTok. I'm actually a pretty big user on TikTok just for that reason, because I know it reaches the younger audience. There is a lot of anti Biden stuff on TikTok, man. I mean, I think and I know there's algorithms and the TikTok algorithm is probably one of the best is one of the best algorithms there is on social media. There is a lot of lot of anti-Biden, anti-Democrat, a lot of anti-woke stuff on TikTok. And so for conservatives to ban it, I think that's a bad, bad idea. I get it. The whole China thing. We talked about this on a previous episode. But anyways. To end off the show, I want to let you know that the younger generation is leaning more conservative. That should leave you with some hope. That shows that there is some light at the end of the tunnel. It's not all doom and gloom and that, yes, Donald Trump may not get majority of younger voters today, but I'm telling you he's going to get a bigger chunk than he did last time because now these younger kids that were 15 during the Trump administration, well, guess what? They got to compare and contrast Donald Trump's economy and Joe Biden's economy. And these people are now 18, 19 years old, and they see the difference, and they want a car. They don't want to have to work three jobs. They see how a crappy economy that Joe Biden has given this country impacts their personal life. And I'm telling you, Donald Trump is going to get a huge chunk of the younger voter. And these poll numbers just... Man, they give me some hope that we actually have the younger generation turning conservative. So, all right, ladies and gentlemen, this was a pretty long show. Didn't intend for it to be this long, but there's just, there was, this was a big topic I needed to touch down on. We needed to know what was in this bill. And even though there's not much that I can even tell you because nobody's had time to read the thing, it just, it just got passed yesterday. And so, we do know that Republicans got screwed once again, and Democrats made out like fat cats. So once again, Democrats steamrolled the Republicans in negotiating a spending bill. So now we're spending more money than we were in 2021 when there was a full-blown pandemic. How does that make sense? Every single one of the framers in their quotes, in their literature, said that responsible spending was necessary. Not the stuff we're getting today. This is so irresponsible what this, what this government is doing, what both of these parties are doing. The Uniparty. So irresponsible. Peddling their influence to the special interest in donors, selling out this country for a buck. And then what they're doing is they're hightailing it out of here and going and working on board seats at Raytheon and Boeing in the military industrial complex. Or, or getting a seat at MSNBC like uh, Ronna McDaniel. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you heard that right. Ronna McDaniel has officially um, is officially a partner of MSNBC. She's a MSNBC contributor. As of today, I just found this out today. She is officially going to be on MSNBC. This was the RNC chair, folks. The RNC chair, right? Just got a seat at MSNBC. So what does that tell you? This is a woman that watched the Republicans lose three elections. And they wanted her to stay. She actually thought she was going to stay in there. The Republicans, the majority of Republicans say, don't remove her. 
Hell, even Donald Trump didn't want to remove her. Well, now she's gone. She got a seat at MSNBC, which pretty much tells everybody that, yeah, she was a rhino. Obviously, everyone knew she was a rhino, but now it's official. Ronna McDaniel just got a job at MSNBC and just exposed her true rhino colors. But now, Laura Trump is the official RNC chair, and you're going to see a lot of great things coming out of this. She is already coming out swinging with lawsuits in key primary states, which is something else I'm going to talk about on the next episode. So listen, this episode went on long enough. I could continue this on for another two and a half hours, but we don't have, this is not a a radio telethon. <laughs> so we're going to have to cut it here and just stick with the hour and, and the hour and a half show that we just did. It's been a while since we did a show this long. So all right, ladies and gentlemen, if you want to follow, if you want to support the show, please download the podcast on all podcast platforms. Follow me on social media. All you have to do is just search my name in your search engine. I don't like to promote Google, but go to your search engine. Just type in my name, Stephen with a V, and that's Toriello, T as in Tom, A U R I E L L O. And you should see all my content on all the platforms. Follow me on social media, follow the show. And also follow me on Rumble. That is very important. That really helps out the show a lot. And the thing that helps out the show the most is just sharing this show. Hit the like button. And most of all, hit the share button. That really helps. Smash the share button. That helps out tremendously. And I would greatly appreciate it, especially if you're on board with this fight against tyranny that we are in. This massive information war with multiple fronts, the massive war on truth. If you're in it with me, please follow the show and share the show with your friends and family. So as always, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for tuning in. I want you guys to have a great Monday. I hope you have an excellent start to your week. At least we get a nice little reset. That's a good thing about Mondays. The only good thing about Mondays. And I want you guys to have a great day. So I will talk to you guys here in a little bit. God bless you and God bless America. You guys have a good one. Bye-bye. Thank you.